I'm going to welcome all the attendees to the first edition of Flea at Home, a virtual flea that we're very excited to, to for it taking place. And for me, it's a great honor to introduce you to our dear friend, Tony Carr. Tony has been a longtime friend of New Ventures, Rodrigo, Armando, Eric, and has been a supporter of Flea since the very beginning. So, and he's always inspiring the staff, uh, inspiring uh, in making connections that are super meaningful. And he's the president of, of uh, Halloran Philanthropy. And previously, previous to that work, he, he led a leadership career in hospital administration. And he's, I could say, I hope I don't speak for himself, I'm just going to. He is passionate about supporting impact entrepreneurs that are uh, alleviating poverty, uh, striving for inclusion and equality, and in general, improving the well being of the most vulnerable communities. So, and we are proud to call him a, an ambassador of new ventures and plea because. <laughs> Uh, he's always transmitting what we do and he's always uh, inspiring him to, to improve and it's such an honor to have you today and I'll let you introduce to one of those meaningful connections he made. He had always talked to us about Paula and her leadership and uh, her work so I'm going to let him do the intro of this uh, speaker that we have been uh, so inspired to to have and and we did invite uh, but for for to uh, the fleeing person but she couldn't make it due to agenda and travel so one of the good things of we at home is that you can actually do it so welcome both of you I'm going to introduce Thank you so much for being here. Great. I'm very happy to uh, uh, be involved in this virtual but real uh, experience. Um, meeting Paolo was clearly one of the, say, highlights of, of my life. Um, working with New Ventures under the leadership of, of Rodrigo, Rodrigo has been an amazing uh, experience. And the impact of their work has been felt for 15 plus years. So, Paola, I wanna begin, um, and it's so good to see you on screen. <laughs> uh, so let us begin with a look at your zodiac sign. As a Scorpio, you are generous, warm-hearted and enthusiastic. You are a perfectionist by nature and you have a tremendous ability to pay attention to detail. Now, did I capture your essence correctly? For did sure. I, did I miss anything? Yeah, I think, I think I'm mysterious too. We are scorpions, so we have you know, all these different sides and all these different dimensions. And I think we share that, no? We are yeah. not serious, but also there are many versions of ourselves. So yeah. I, I, that's it. Thank you, Tony. I think the beauty is having so many facets of your personality that are bound together uh, with your generosity and your enthousi enthusiasm for life. So. So, Paola is the former Minister of Culture of Colombia and a dear friend for many years. She is the first Afro-Colombian to be appointed to a cabinet position. Since leaving the government, Paola founded Manos Visibles, Visible Hands, a peace-building NGO in Colombia that works with the Afro-Colombian community to implement programs for political advocacy, youth development, women's rights and empowerment. Uh, I've watched this organization grow over the years. Paola was selected by the Council of the Americas as one of the most influential leaders in Latin America. 
She was also recognized by the National Conference of U.S. Black Mayors as one of the most important Black leaders in the world. In 2013, she was listed by the BBC as one of the top 100 female world leaders. Her most cherished recognition came last year, one of her most cherished. That's when she received the Global Fairness Award for advancing racial equality around the world. Paola is an industrial engineer, interestingly enough, by education and holds a master's degree in management studies from Cambridge. She was also a Fulbright scholar at MIT in 2014. She was named a Yale World Fellow. And currently, Paola serves on the board of the Ford Foundation. One of her great achievements was writing her memoir called The Power of the Invisible. I am so happy uh, and so delighted to have this conversation with you, Paula. So let's begin with a few, few questions. Uh, so let's begin with, with the beginning. Paula, tell us about your early years as an Afro-Colombian growing up in Bogota and growing up in Colombia, two different places. <laughs> sure, sure. And Tony, thank you very much for sharing with me this moment. I think it's also the celebration of our friendship. We have been friends for so many years. Uh, you have been a big mentor, a big supportive force for Visible Hands and a great friend. So I just want to thank you. And uh, I thank you also New Ventures for this opportunity, because I think we all, now we, need, we really need each other, you know? We really need to share our stories. We really need to be connected, to be present. So for me, it's great to be here. And just um, thinking about your questions, and I think you're half Colombian as well. I, I think you have <laughs> Colombian part. And um, there are many Colombians, you know, as there are many U.S. I mean, sometimes when you grow up in, I grew up in Bogota. And for me, growing up in Bogota was always feeling that I didn't belong here because we were the only black family in the neighborhood. I was the only black girl at school. I was in many places, the only one or the first one. And for me, my, my, my childhood was like a, a combination because it was being bo from Bogota and, and, but no one believing that I was from Bogota <laughs> because the way I look. But at the same time, I spent my holidays in the Pacific coast with my aunts and just being in my mother's hometown was so important for me because there I create a deep sense of family. Mm -hmm. You know, at this sense of, uh, I learned to love nature. I learned to love, to love the life of a hometown where I can, I could go out without, you know, even permission. I can move around. Everyone knew who I was. And, and was like, I was the, the youngest of 15 cousins. So I was like the baby mm -hmm. of the family, <laughs> of a very big family. So it was so beautiful because I spent like three or four months a year in my mother's hometown. And then I was in Bogota where I was more, let's say isolated. So it was like a, a, a combination of experiences to be honest, but my sense of identity and family and community, I really felt in my mother's hometown in the Pacific coast. So before turning 30, you became the minister of culture. Um, an awesome honor and responsibility at such a young age. What did you learn about the Afro-Colombian community during your term of office? You know, I really learned, um, Tony, because I was 28. Mm. I really learned that power didn't look like me, you know, mm. that power structure and Colombian elites didn't look like people like me. You know, a young woman 
African descent, not from an elite family, or, you know, like surname that people would say, oh, no, so she's the daughter of, when people ask what my mother did, I was like, yeah, my mother's a lawyer and this and that, but people were like, but how did you come to be in this position being you? Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it was really important to have this experience when I was so young, um, because I, I really just put all my energy on that. I really, I slept like four hours a day. And I really worked hard to show that when you become from uh, a minister, from a diverse background, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you cannot represent, that you just represent your background and do not represent the whole country. Mm -hmm. and it was a beautiful experience to show that even if I was young, because I was 28, so people were like, all the people that I was managing was older than me, and they were like, uh, "What? What are you? Are you giving me orders? Are, are you telling me what to do? <laughs> do you have to really?" And for me, it was very important to know. And in at that moment, I was really uh, trying to be humble and say, "Look, I mean, I'm learning from you. I'm giving you some framework, and I'm doing a part of this job, and I'm very happy to learn from you." And also, yeah, I'm young and I'm not pretending to be the expert in cultural management, mm. but I'm a manager and I feel this country and I want to serve and we can partner on that. So it was a, a very uh, hard experience, to be honest with you. Every single day I felt that I was, you know, in, in kind of exam or that I was an experiment mm. because no one understood how a person like me could be in that position. What was your reaction? when you were offered the, uh, the position, your initial reaction? I was, I was, you know, it was very interesting because the president, he asked me some questions, but he never asked me whether I wanted to be a minister. Uh -huh. I think so that I was so nervous that if he asked me, I would kind of just panicking and wouldn't say what he wanted me to say. So he didn't say a word, he wouldn't, he just went out from the room that we were and you know like 100 meters or 200 meters he was just said oh please announce that she's the new minister so he didn't ask me so it was shocking but i remember calling my mother you know five minutes later tony and asking my mother and saying mother i don't know what i'm getting into <laughs> yeah. I don't know, what I'm, you know what i'm doing i'm you know he just said that and my mother was really really you know, she was really calm that I was, that my, I, I felt my mother would be enthusiastic or so happy, yeah. but I was really cold, to be honest. And she said like, Paula, you are not more than anyone else. You are not less than anyone else. Mm -hmm. So be calm and we talk later. And she just stopped talking to me. So I think, you know, it was a very strong moment. Yeah. <clears throat> I imagine you, you felt the support from your family, your extended family for the position. So how did this experience as Minister of Culture change your life as a 28 year old uh, woman? And what were the big challenges and accomplishments? I think it changed, uh, Tony, something that I have been trying to share with the leaders of our networks and with grassroots communities that I work with in the last decade. And um, it changed my sense of power. I realized I have power. Mm. And I realized that I have the value, the capacity to also drive a country in a specific way, in so many ways. So I realized that um, I had power and also that my country needed me and, and celebrate me. And in many ways, after the time passes and people saw results, give me the opportunity. And in many areas that were no African descent or everything, I was one of them. It was not them, it was, it was us in our diversity. So I think for me that was, and I think the accomplishment, because when you are that experience, sometimes you don't realize, I mean, you see that, you know, you have indicators and then you sure. have this and, and everything. But after you finish, it's when you see the results. Mm. Because you are walking in an airport and then you realize that you pass a law that improved the reality of librarians in, the world, in, in, in this country. 
and you meet one Lee Bryan and he's, he's saying, okay, I remember you. And I remember what we did together. So I think passing laws, improving the budgets, you know, visiting more than 300 municipalities and also getting close to people and saying, you know, I, I value what you do. And also, you know, Tony, um, I, I'm just realizing that coming from a excluded community as, as black woman, as an Afro-descendant woman, I understood that the cultural, cultural sector was also excluded yes. because there was no fully value in what they contribute to the country development. So coming from that place, from this subjectivity as a black woman, also I could understand artists, I could understand the full meaning of being um, from a different sector, I could understand culture as a basic need, I could understand so many things and, and try to advocate for them inside the government, but also do things in a scale way. I always felt that your sense of power was something that you realized was, was bestowed uh, sort of upon you because of your relationship to the people at, uh, at a grassroots level. That it was an honor to have power, to use that power for, for change. Sure. So we know that life is a sort of never ending series of turning points. I love the concept of life as, as uh, turning points. What were some of the big turning points, some of which you've alluded to already, that have shaped your life? I mean, there are many. Uh, the ministry was a big one. I mean, it was a big change because I never dreamed even to be a minister. I had never participated in a political party. I mean, it was, it just came and arrived and it changed my whole life. And mm -hmm. to recognize I became a public figure. That's one. Then I think when I started losing, like after I ended my period as a minister, Tony, I started losing um, uh, some members of my family died. And I think that was really a moment for transcend in my life. I mean, to really see that um, I was a human being, to deal with that pain, and also, and also to, you know, to realize that life is always virtual, that is not, is not take, that you cannot take it, that you cannot give it for granted, and that it changed. And also passing that pain for me was very important because I could look to communities in the eyes and say, I understand also your pain. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I have passed through many things and I understand that we can, we can pass also these complexities. Mm -hmm. You know, I love the expression that life is, is all about the people you meet, the people that you're uh, fortunate to meet. Tell us about the most important people in your life, Paula. I think my, my, the women in my life, I'm, uh, you know, I have a matriarchal structure, my mother, mm -hmm. my aunts, my cousin, they just were so important to me. They, you know, I, they, they really always build so many things in me, my self-esteem. Um, they, even if we were not a wealthy family, they were like, what do you want to do? You want to go to study to England? Try. And we, <laughs> you know, like they were like, why not? I mean, why are, there are, pe there are things for other people and not for you. You are equal and you are the same and you deserve the best. So try. And I think these women um, really shaped my courage, really shaped my life and, and have been very important. And I think uh, over the years as well, I have had a very nice group of mentors and people who have been there for me, who have believed in my dreams like you, who have been supportive and who have always been there with me even when I was a minister or then when I create visible hands, I always have had like a group of people who believe and have been there for me. And I'm really, you know, so, and the community is Tony because the communities gave me a sense of humanity that, um, you know, so um, they just share with me so many things, you know, celebrate with me, give me love. So, and seeing the transformation in their lives has just given my life so much sense. So I think many people, I mean, just to, <laughs> just to be brief. 
<laughs> so you're the founder of Manos Visibles, Visible Hands. Uh, what inspired you to create this NGO in Colombia? Oh, that's a good thing. First things, I, when I ended my period as a minister, I knew I didn't want to be a politician. Mm. I didn't want to keep my political career, you know? So, and mm. I wanted to be free. I didn't want to be in a power structure, mm. uh, like with bura uh, bureaucracy and all these, you know, power fights. So I decided that I wanted to create my own space mm -hmm. where I can, you know, work with friends and work to do the work that I really like to do that is working with grassroots communities. Mm -hmm. So we create visible hands um, uh, as a space for working with communities, but also being the first and the only one uh, black woman in the government and, and black person in a high position, I realized that I really needed to nurture leadership to have mm -hmm. more diverse power structures in Colombia. I, I really needed to work for that. Mm -hmm. uh, that so many people invested in my education and in my training and believing in me. So I had the responsibility also to help to develop a network of leaders that could also be not just the first or the only one, but naturally become uh, ministers or majors or everything with a, spirit, with a special um, spirit. So I decided then to create, and that's why the name, you know, the visible hands is people who are many times invisible, but that receiving training and receiving all these different elements to nurture their sense of agency, then mm -hmm. they occupy and change power relations in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So you are a purpose-driven purpose person, a purpose-driven person. What is your approach to leadership? And what have you learned as a woman working in a very conservative country? Yeah, I mean, leadership is about serving people, but with a pragmatic and a strategic way of doing things. I believe that, um, and in this moment I have, uh, I have just shared with our network, I mean, being leader in good conditions is almost doing your job. But when things come, become critical or are complex, then it's when your real leadership comes out. So I think it's about service, but with pragmatism and with a strategy to achieve results. And I think it's a, it's a combination that, um, and it's a combination also of different layers, Tony, because I think um, I have been really working in leadership myself to be the leader of my life first. Mm -hmm. And then how can I be a leader of my organization? And then how I can be a leader of the Afro-Colombian communities and how can I be a leader in this country and in the world? Mm -hmm. But it all started with me. It's not just being, you know, out, but it's really what is going on inside me. And being a leader of my life, it's really, it's a projection of what I do elsewhere. So it's, it's a very um, good exercise. And, um, and then um, a woman in a conservative country, yeah, it's had been, it, it has been hard because uh, so many times you, you just uh, get tired of explaining yourself. Mm -hmm. Why you? And then you need to explain. People don't believe in you just because of how you look. People just judge you and you are, a, you are just a member of a deficit community, you know, kind of a community that is always with this stigma of so many things and people don't know you. And I think uh, for me, it, it, uh, after so many, I, I've just, I was thinking this week was the Afro-Colombian day. Mm -hmm. And I would think I have been working in racial issues for more than 15 years. And it's tiring being every single day, um, forgiving people from ignorance, um, trying to explain yourself, trying to say that you are human and, and that your communities have a value. And there is a more complete story that in, in which we all are involved. And um, so I think it, it has been hard. And being a woman as well, as well, because people are not used of your position of power. People just get, a, it's normal if a, a man has the power, but if you have the power, then people become sometimes kind of afraid or intimidated by your power mm -hmm. and, and create this 
new normal of, of women being in positions of powers is not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. I think one of the experiences that has helped you grow has been your involvement, um, not only in Latin America, but your involvement in the States and in Europe, and basically your involvement in the world. So you can look at racial issues from a, from a different vantage point. You can see your role uh, as a woman, uh, not just in Colombia, but in Latin America, in the Americas, which has been, I think, a real force in, in your life. So Visible Hands has touched the lives of, of many Afro-Colombians. How do you measure your impact? And uh, how do you personally renew and sort of refresh yourself, uh, your passion and your commitment to the work that you do? You know, Tony, these leaders, we have three, more than 3,500 leaders today. And now I can see that they are performing power that they came back to the most complex community with armed conflict in Colombia. And they are majors, they are secretary of state, mm -hmm. they are performing powers. With, now the problem is how they are performing power. That's mm -hmm. another thing. Yeah. Because it's not an ideal world where people just get into power, things are perfect, and people mm -hmm. just behave the way that you expect it. But many people dare to, to, to say, okay, I go there. And to see many people who just saw an enhanced version of themselves uh, has been a strategic and now is performing power. Even as we have now one of our leaders that is a minister of science, or we have majors in more than 10 municipalities, or we have people in the main cooperation agencies, we have people who are advisors of ministers, mm -hmm. and people from the grassroots mm -hmm. just being present and being there and showing that we need to build this country from all the diversity that uh, inhabited this country, no? And I think that that's part of the result, but also to see the new generations with more agency. Do you know, like I'm now seeing all this group of black girls, mm. just so certain that they deserve to be in a position to serve their communities, to go abroad, to do things, and I see hundreds of them, you know, with a speech, with a clarity, with so many things at self-esteem that for me just incredible and important. And on the, other, on, on the other hand, Tony, I think also see how we have advanced agenda with traditional Colombian elites mm -hmm. that had been educating through the process and had made this kind of swift or not just talking about them as black mm. there, right. but talking about us. I mean, that has been, because there are different sides, no? It's not just about black for blacks or, or you know, gender for women or, mm. you know, it's a, it's a whole process where we all interact and create this deep connection and recognize each other. And then we can see each other in each of us. So in your leadership position, how do you stay close? to the people you serve, bringing you know, empathy and your heart to your work? In general, with all our groups, I just uh, make the training, the first part of the training program, the life project program, when people analyze their inner leadership and the leadership in their life. So it's like a projection mm -hmm. with them of the right. thing that I learned but it's how you lead your life. And I try always to do the first, the first, you know, like the first session and try to go to the communities at least once a month. And, and yeah, I always try to be there, to be present there, to build from there, to, you know, because when you get too distant from the reality, then you don't know what is working and what is not working. Or yeah. even we are mapping leaders mm. and, and in the sessions, I realized which are my new, you know, fellows, mm -hmm. like the, the, the top leaders of these groups. Mm -hmm. Well, and people want to see you uh, more often with great frequency and figuring out how to be present is, is always, you know, a challenge in the, in the role that, that you do have. Uh, so let's talk about the coronavirus in terms of 
how has that experience or how has that affected you know the work of manus visibilis i mean this is an um you know this is an existential crisis tony it's an existential mm -hmm. crisis so unprecedented and for us of course it we we are all about proximity we mm -hmm. always have been physical and gathering groups and just creating this sense of community and everything and then suddenly to say every, all our, our work will be virtual mm -hmm. in and also working virtual in a in a in a region in our country where you don't have good connectivity mm -hmm. where many people don't have to pay for internet where so it becomes how we can how how do we connect mm -hmm. uh, the people and how do make sense when there are no the basic conditions you know and this is it, it has been a whole it's a it has been a whole challenge it has been a whole process to create a narrative for this situation mm -hmm. to really you know rise to the challenge to really refurnish yourself retooling yourself and the team to respond and to keep the leaders motivated and also to see what are the opportunities that we are getting from here. Mm. You know, what are the real opportunities that we are getting from here? But it has been complex because we work in, in the region with the poorest indicators in the country where there were no beds, the hospital didn't work, and so many vulnerabilities that the beginning, I mean, we helped to kind of create some conditions, but the health system in the Pacific coast is just, you know, a very bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew it before, but now it became more critical because you were like, people, you really need to stay at home because otherwise you don't have a hospital to go. It's just death. But at the same time, telling people in the most vulnerable areas, stay at home when you don't have something to eat is very complex. Mm -hmm. When people, 80% of the people, 80 to 90% of the people are in the informal economy and then you are saying, staying at home and what well, I'm going to do to it, you know? And even just to end, um, saying people, you know, you need just to wash your hands. Yeah, but we don't have water services. Yeah, right. You know, our water is polluted. So it, 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 is, it has been a very critical moment, Tony because all the inequalities just became in your face, are in your mm. face. And then you cannot move there, you cannot do things, you need to keep virtual being present and play a bridging kind of role as an organization. And also as you are learning to manage the situation, uh, you are teaching or even asking leaders to join you in that effort. But it's, it's very complex to be honest mm. with you. Yeah, I don't think people realize how large is the Afro-Colombian population in Colombia. And it's what the second largest uh, community of African descendants in Latin America. Uh, sure, it's, uh, we are 10 million people. In the last census, I don't know why half of us disappear, but we are 10 million, <laughs> wow. you know? And, and we're 10 million people, but the interesting thing of this study, seeing the, the most vulnerable communities for COVID-19 or coronavirus mm -hmm. in this country are ethnic communities, indigenous communities in the Amazon and mm -hmm. black communities in the Pacific coast, the mm -hmm. most critical, and even the Caribbean as well. Yes. These three regions are the, you know, the most affected. When you go to Brazil, don't, talk about it when you go to the u.s don't talk about it mm -hmm. you know and even if africans are are you know dealing with that because they have been with pandemias before and they have deal with these kind of things it's a uh, it's, it's very critical to see how this racial issue plays a role in inequality and 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 how it became so clear now mm -hmm. so one of your great achievements is your book which, which, as I recall, probably took about 10 years to write. It doesn't matter how long it took. The important thing is that you wrote your memoir called The Power of the Invisible, a memoir of solidarity, humanity, and resistance. I feel like 
you were called to write uh, your story. You were called to write this book. So tell us about the power of the invisible and the message or messages you hope to communicate. So for me, it was so important to share experience, um, but share experience from a very human perspective, not preaching on saying people, you know, you should do this, but just sharing how I was feeling, what were, what were the questions that I was just facing and trying to answer, to share my, my, my soul to a mayor stand with them, with all the contradictions and with all the, and for me it was key, and it was like as a, thera uh, a psychotherapy exercise, to be yeah. honest, it, making sense of my life and my experience through the process of writing this memoir and organize the memory. And I just wanted to share one of the beautiful things. And this, the book has been also a very important historical moment in my life. But you know, my mother, after she read the book, she called me. Mm -hmm. And my mother and my, the women in my life, my grandmother and all are very present in the book, are characters of the book. And my mother just uh, said, Paula, you know, I understood my mother when I read, I read your book, mm. I understood uh, why wow. so many things. So the book was very important in, in a personal sense, but also when I have gone to the communities, it has been very interesting because, you know, in one of the, in the middle of the jungle of Colombia, we have the opportunity to go to schools, share the book. Uh, we just distribute more than 5,000 books. Mm. And I remember being in one of the schools and a kid just uh, raised his hand and said, Paula, uh, how, how have you learned to deal with death? It was 13 Ooh. years old. Wow. You know, you book talk about many losses in your life, many people who are missing now. How have you learned to deal with that? Wow. You know? So we're very deep conversations. In another one, one girl just says, dude, and said, Paula, your book talk a lot about your professional life. It is possible to have a balance between your personal and professional life. <laughs> you need to focus on, you know, so it was a very deep, you know, conversation. And I remember telling this girl, you know, I want you to be better than me in so many ways. <laughs> you know? I, I didn't realize how you need balance, you need, but now you realize that you are 15 years old. Yep, so that's all the book mean for me. It was the opportunity also for the new leadership in women or from ethnic communities or for people in the margins in this country because it's not just about ethnicity, it's about class, it's so many things. And, um, and I think it, it gave me the opportunity to share my experience but even to challenge them to say, okay, you, you know, I wasn't that good in so many things. You can be <laughs> that was That was beautiful, Tony. Mm. Sorry if I took so long to answer this. <laughs> I think you discovered that you loved to write, that there was a special uh, experience that you gained from, uh, from telling your story. Uh, so the power of the invisible is uh, as a tribute to you and to all the invisible people of Colombia whose contributions to humanity are denied. Uh, so the power of the invisible, as I see it, is above all, it's a tribute to, to hope and to love for a world that uh, is free of discrimination and racism. Um, so I love this short expression uh, about you and for you, uh, that you have so much life yet to live and so much life yet to give. Uh, what are your big hopes and dreams for the future? I mean, your really, really big, big dreams. You know, Tony, I, this is an existential crisis and I'm, I'm living it. I mean, I'm not, you know. <laughs> and part of the thing, of, of the interesting thing of this moment is to learn to be present in the present, mm. to be fully present in the present, 
mm. and also to to see what is really worthwhile in life and to see what do you want what are this, the essential things in your life no and um and for me it has been a question all these days you know because it is harder mm. to balance and even if I have, you know, all the privileges and conditions, I have a nice home and everything, but to be able to inspire others, how do I inspire myself in these conditions? So I have been asking these existential questions to say, oh my God, um, what do I want to do next? Because maybe three months ago, I would say, I want to do this. I do want to do this exchange with the African continent and I want to do this, you know, and I would be more but now I think I'm, I'm really thinking about it. And I think my goals are more personal in terms of me being, having a balanced life, mm. being more present, also recognizing that I'm in, the mom, in a moment of my life where I have been, you know, at least influencing the training and the opportunities for more, I would say that almost 10,000 leaders in this country from different backgrounds and different communities. Mm. And as I mentioned to them when this started, that everyone was calling, Paula, we need to do that. I was like, are you a leader? What are you doing? I mean, there is no heroes here. We are a collective. Mm. And I need you to show your leadership in this moment, you know, mm. because I'm not, you know, uh, there is no, no one to save here, the other. Mm. We are a collective. So I, in the following years, I really want just to, keep nurturing leadership to see them performing powers and open a space for them to show their leadership, not me doing, you know, so many things. And a particular dream, I would really like to encourage indigenous leadership now. I really want to, to create this uh, multi-diversity leadership scale um, because I really want to transcend the racial thing. I know it's very difficult because every time it's so complex to, to forget that we are under all this racial inequality. But I really dream to, for instance, work more with indigenous leaders and also to connect in a more profound way with the African continent. Yeah. To really create more, you know, like more structural, not just exchanges people to people, but really more structural connection and power, global power. For me, I think that would be, and writing another book, Tony, <laughs> writing another book, but I need to isolate myself. <laughs> so I can write my, my new book now. <laughs> Maybe you, t you should travel to Brazil and find a, a secluded beach somewhere. For sure. Um, I have been to Brazil a lot, you know, I, I really, I'm very close to that country and I learned Portuguese. I'm very close to Brazil and Brazilian leaders, but mm -hmm. sure, Parachi could be a good, a good point, no doubt. And you were, you were in Brazil when, uh, oh, the woman who was the leader, she was... Yeah, Marielle Franco. Yeah, yeah, she, who, so. she was assassinated. Sure, sure. I was in the World Economic Forum. I was yeah. receiving an award for visible hands but you know, I, I spent four days in Sao Paulo and in a global economic forum, in the World Economic Forum, we were, I don't know how many people, 5,000 people or so. I was the only black woman in that setting in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. Wow. Wow. And the day, Mariela was killed. Yeah. And when I asked people and leaders from Brazil, where were the black leaders and people in a country that is 50% black? Mm -hmm. They were like, you want to see black people, you just go to the favelas mm -hmm. or you just see the waitress in a restaurant, Paula, but that's where you are going to see them, mm -hmm. you know? And I was really shocked, to be honest. I was really shocked. But I have many friends and many people who are trying there. And, um, and we just, you know, tomorrow I'm teaching a course with Itaú Cultural on cultural leadership and race in Brazil with one of my mm -hmm. best friends the yeah. director of, of uh, Feira Preta, Black Fair, one of the yeah. biggest. So we are just, you know, we, we are just there. Mm. There are many places. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you alluded to it, but your work has connected the, or connects the Afro-Colombian community to the uh, African nations by promoting so intercultural 
and political exchanges. Uh, reflect on the deep memories of racial issues that bind the humanity of our two continents. Did you hear me? Oops. Yes, perfectly. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's thinking about it. I'm just, I, I, I'm just going to do a small reminder. We don't have any upcoming sessions, so we can make this one longer. I just want to be mindful of our amazing panelists that we keep on, and we're having a lot of really interesting questions. So I say we keep it going, but just want to be mindful of your time too. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Okay. Yes. So. Um, so, uh, uh, Tony, sorry, I missed your last question. Can, can you repeat it, please? Sure, sure. Uh, so your work connects the Afro-Colombian community to African nations by promoting intercultural exchanges as well as political exchanges. Uh, reflect on the deep memories of racial issues that bind the humanity of our two continents. Sure. I think, Tony, um, as I mentioned, and you started on purpose with that question, what does it mean to be an Afro-Colombian child yes. growing up? So, um, and for us, we didn't appear in the history of this country. You know, we, we have been foreigners in so many ways. Mm. You know, we were always told that the people who made this country and everything didn't look like us. And the only, you know, memory was slavery, but slavery taught in a very, you know, animal way. And then just uh, Spanish people became tired of, 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 you know, of Africans and then they liberate, but it was not the struggle of African people. Mm. So there are so many untold or partially stories that just uh, are in our mind and set our space in society that we really need to rewrite. And to rewrite that histo those stories, we need to go to the source. Mm. That's why for me it's so important to go to the continent because when I'm going to the continent and to many countries, no one is asking me where I'm from, you know, in general. Mm. It's not like, um, because in Bogota, you know, I'm used like, are you from Bogota? I'm like, yeah, I was born here. Why? I was like, my mother came to work here, so I'm here. <laughs> So why, you know, like, you look in, in a specific way, people will just make you feel that you are not. Why did you were born here? Mm. So when I'm going to the continent, it's co coming from home to home, mm. just back home to home. And for me, it's like coming, even if I speak my regular Portuguese, my regular French, or when I come to the continent, to many countries, it's like, uh, you know, people ask me, where are you from? But they are like, this is a mistake. What are you doing in Colombia? In Nigeria, they were like, you are from here. You are from this tribe. You are, and, I mean, there was a mistake that you are in Colombia, but remember, you are from here. So for me, and I think for our leadership process and our goal to make a more diverse society in equal terms, Africa is very important because for this 10 million African descent, and for many Colombians, because it's just the cultural trace as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just a color, but it's a cultural trace there. Mm -hmm. Then we recognize each other, we understand each other, and we recognize that we didn't start, that our history didn't start from slavery, that we mm -hmm. had a history before. Mm -hmm. And that also as Africa is evolving, and, and, you, and there are many Africas, Mm -hmm. um, also, we are evolving, and there are many versions of, of us, you know, facets and many stories of us. So, uh, in the Pacific Coast, people always thought that we should look at to Asia, you know, to China, mm -hmm. to others. But I was first, you need to look to Africa because we're, that's where we, and when I brought leaders from the continent, you should see children, mm -hmm. you know, in why you who look like me are so far away. <laughs> why? <laughs> and, start to analyze, to understand, because huh. where you come from is very important in the way you define your life project. And understanding that, understanding the complexity of that, 
understanding. And it's not to go to live back in Africa or coming back to Africa. But he's saying there is a part of me who, who is just there. And, and this part has so many elements and there's not a single narrative to this identity. And that's very important. And I think, for instance, in my case, my connection with African-Americans, was this, you know, transnational African identity that I have? Because half of the people who have supported my career are African-Americans. And, and they just were like, you are one of us, you know? Or, so there is this whole sense of solidarity that I think is very important because it's part of our power, but also it's very important for us to understand who we are, where mm -hmm. we come from, and feel proud, and have role models, and even evolve our image of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So recently you went to Mozambique. Uh, what did you learn from your recent experience there that touched your heart and soul and filled you with joy? You know, I was so happy. I'm, I'm, you know, in the country, I'm so happy, Tony, and I have my three, you know, closest country where I, when I arrive, people are like, you are from here, that Mali, that I got to know Mali because oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I connect me to, with Salif, and yeah. I have one of the greatest experience in my life. You know, when I arrived at the immigration in Mali, in the airport, people were like, welcoming back, welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no one, you know, the police didn't stop me. It, it was like, you know, you are by mistake there. You belong here. So I love Mali. I love Nigeria. I really love Mozambique. And I had the opportunity to be in Mozambique this year before the lockdown. And it was amazing because it's just, you know, it's so natural. I was working with a group of women uh, in the Mafalala Museum, that is a beautiful project that a friend of mine is running in Mafalala, that, who was the independence neighborhood in Love, Mozambique. Mm -hmm. And he's changing the narrative of that neighborhood, saying, you know, uh, we need to change the narrative. And I was just dancing with these women and enjoying the music, but it was so natural, no? It was just so, oh my God. It was just so, <laughs> you know, just being one of them, just hugging them, just dancing with them, you know, just in, in a natural setting and receiving <clears throat> the force of these uh, African culture and African women who were just so welcoming. And so, so it's, it's just that, you know, you, you belong there. It's so natural. Yeah, that was a beautiful video, particularly the way it uh, ended. Um, so, Maria, how are we doing on time? Have we exceeded? So I our think the if you are if you are willing to to stay on, we have some interesting questions that I think you would enjoy answering. So we can take maybe two or three questions and maybe a conclusion. We don't have any other sessions, so we could do. We can run it until uh, it would be noon in Mexico. So, and I think in Colombia too. I'm not saying right now. <laughs> so we can run it until it's uh, for seven more minutes. So, Paola, are you good for time? Yeah, no, no, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Omnipresent. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So I think Anna Gastelum on our side is going to be leading the Q&A and... Hi, Anna. Hi, it's so great to have you both. Thank you for, for this Hi. session. We have a lot of excitement from our attendees and I'll start with Anna Laura's question saying, where can we find Paula's book? Anna Laura and all the people who are just watching and have been with us during the, all this time, so many social innovators, so many people, you know, trying. So I just want to say hello to all of you. I wish I could see you, but anyway, we will have another uh, moment. My book is in, in Amazon. You can order in Amazon or Kindle. You just, you just write El Poder de lo Invisible, and it will appear. It's published by Random House, and you can just find it there. And I hope in the following years, it will be in English as well. Yeah. Perfect. Thank Great. you. Um, Midori asks, can you share with us one thought that rep represents you and led you to achieve more goals? 
Oof, that's a big question. That's, um, I love this African proverb that is very used by really like, that is, I am because we are. Yeah, <clears throat> right. You know, and I am because we are. I mean, it's not me. Mm -hmm. There are so many people uh, in front of me, behind me, and I represent so many things. And I just move forward because of all these people who are with me during the different processes that I have lived in my life. So I think it's not just me. I talk about me, but it's not just me. It's a we, you know, it's us, so. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'll read one last question, which is from Pilar and says, Paula, I'm a Mexican, but have lived and worked in Nigeria. How would you say, why haven't we built as a Latin American region, a wider community, not only by the recognition, but in terms of capacity development for youth, for example? I think there are many questions there. But I think um, still Latin America, we really need to find our power at what really, you know, connect us. I think as, a, as an international community, we are getting weaker and weaker. And we have a big, big task to really become again, uh, or not again, but trying to really be a global power because we are really divided. And I think it's, um, and in terms of youth, of course, uh, I mean, building opportunity for young people um, means also give power to young people. And as I mentioned, we are not used to that. It's not just giving training and giving. And young people last year, and I think we have been in a chain of change from last year. You know, it's, I don't know if there's an astrological or something, mm. but all this mo social mobilization that we had last year, led by young people, show, you, show us the power of young people. And we have a generation who, is, um, who has an agency, who is developing the tools, and we really need to give them a space and power to, to show us this new society that we need, more equal, more. I think last year was so, so interesting in that. Perfect, thank you. And lastly, uh, a lot of attendees are eager to reach out to both of you. Is there a channel of your organizations or what would be the best way to get involved with your projects or reach out? Okay. For me, uh, the easiest way is just writing in the, in the Visible Hands website. They will follow directly to, to me or to the team members. <laughs> Or even by social networks, I really uh, read notes uh, on Instagram uh, from time to time. Not really in Facebook, but on Instagram, I, I, I read what people write there and, and we can connect and we can yeah, follow each other. Yeah. So for me, the best way to reach me is uh, by email and that's uh, jtonycarr at uh, gmail.com. So... Maria, do we need to bring things to a close? Any more questions? I would love to get your last thoughts before we wrap up. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're ready. I don't want it to end. It's been really great. I, you know, <laughs> yeah. I could yeah. spend the whole day. Yeah. So for me, I have, I have loved spending this, this time with you, Paola, as a, as a friend, as a very special friend who's watched you grow over time and has seen the diversity of your work and your interest. But uh, has, what has impressed me is, is your passion and commitment uh, and, and how you cherish the power that you do have. So, gracias. Thank you for who you are and what you do. No, thank you, Tony. I mean, what can I say? I just say thanks. Thanks. Thank you for being there, for seeing me as a human being, first of all, for believing in my leadership, in my projects, in believing. And not just me. I mean, we are mm. a group of people, mm. a global people who follow you mm. and who you inspire and nurture 
So I'm so grateful just for your presence, for being uh, hip hop dancing, mm -hmm. you know, mate, and mm -hmm. at the same time of being in the favelas with me in Medellin. Mm -hmm. uh, even when I'm sad, um, you are there, or even if I'm dating somebody, I share that with you. <laughs> <laughs> you meet the guy and you're like, Paula, come on, what are you doing? <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what, what are you doing there? So, you know, and, and I think the beauty of life, Tony, is having this, as you have mentioned many times, deep connection, human connections. And um, these connections to inspire, to motivate each other, to be close, even if, because we have always been close. We see each other once mm -hmm. a year in Bogota, or mm -hmm. if we coincide in some place in the U.S., maybe New York, and go to our hip hop bar there. Mm -hmm. I hope they don't close with this economic crisis. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and um, and any place we meet, we are just close. Even if if we don't see each other, we are close. Yeah. <clears throat> and I am really grateful for your friendship, for being there, for believing in me, uh, but above all for giving this human experience to me because I think, you know, in this, in this uh, coronavirus thing, I was telling a friend of mine that the real comes so uh, clear. Mm. You know, like mm. the real connection, the real commitment, the real, the, as we were talking, this is virtual, but it's real. It's real. And the real becomes so clear. And I'm, I'm really grateful and I'm really happy that this is, is real. We just shared that in public. So yeah. thank you, very much, Tony. And thank you, Maria, for your work as well. Yeah, thank you for Maria. Yeah. And so we keep, we keep going. Okay. We keep going. And you know, today's African day. Today's <gasps> African day. So it was, you know, it meant to be. Yeah. Okay. A day for celebration. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you all very much, Maria. Thank you for making this happen. And uh, I feel like we, we are a great team. Thank you both so much. We are honored by your participation and it's been a really inspirational chat. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your time. Uh, the community is, the chat is firing up. So thank you so much. And, and I have to say once again that for Tony and Paula, it's holiday day. So it's Memorial Day in the United States. And Paula, I forgot the holiday it is in Colombia because it's holiday number. <laughs> <laughs> Money. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Leaving. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.